Okay, so this video is going to look at the poem The Girl with the Keys to Pierce's Cottage by Paul Durkin. And just before we start, by, uh, to read the poem, I just want you to think about the idea of emigration. Okay, so emigration has been a very important aspect of life in Ireland, uh, really since the time of the famine in the 1840s. Um, and, you know, Irish people have been leaving this country en masse for decades and decades, from the, from the 1840s up until the 1960s, um, and even into modern times. So even though the population, you know, started growing from the 1960s onwards, there is still a lot of immigration, still a lot of young people leaving. Um, so most of you will know some people in your life who have emigrated, uh, probably to America or England or Australia. That would be some of the bigger uh, destinations, more popular destinations at the moment. But there's very different reasons for why people emigrate. I want you to think, are the reasons that people emigrate nowadays, are they the same as you would have expected people to have emigrated for in decades gone past? So the poem we're looking at today, uh, Durkin tells us that he it's based when he was 16. Durkin was born in 1944, so it's based around the year 1960. So we think around the year 1960, and people are emigrating. Why are they emigrating for the same reason? So in modern times, we would probably say that people emigrate for a few different reasons. A lot of people, especially in their early, late teens and early 20s, would emigrate for uh, the opportunity to go and travel and see the world and that adventure aspect of emigration. There's also, however, the pull of the job market. So myself, for example, I left Ireland and went to the UK for three years because there's a pull there. There's a lot of jobs available at the time where they weren't so much available in Ireland. So there's economic reasons at the moment for why people emigrate and there's also cultural and personal and social reasons for why people choose to emigrate. And this is very much the same back in the 1960s. However, the idea of social and, you know, emigrating for enjoyment and for adventure isn't quite as strong. It's much more the need and the economic need to emigrate. People leave Ireland because there simply is no jobs within Ireland. If you want to have an affluent future, you're most likely going to have to seek that in a different country. Now, whilst people in the later 1960s did begin to return, and this is the first time we see the Irish population really start to go up in over a century, it, at the beginning of the 19th century, people are very much leaving, or sorry, beginning of the 1960s, people are very much leaving, and those people who are returning tend to be people who have gone and made a lot of money elsewhere and then are able to bring that money now back to Ireland, and that's why they're coming back. So, what we're going to do today is read through and annotate the poem, The Girl with the Keys to Pierce's Cottage. We want to understand the importance of immigration, history and culture to this poem and compare aspects of the poem, possibly with the poem Nessa, or uh, you can bring it in to the other poem we've looked at, which is the McBride Dynasty. So remember, you do need to be comparing the different poems by the poets. And we'll just start off with a read through the poem, The Girl with the Keys to Pierce's Cottage. When I was 16, I met a dark girl. Her dark hair was darker because her smile was so bright. She was the girl with the keys to Pierce's cottage, and her name was Coit Calan. The cottage was built into the side of the hill. I recall two windows and a cosmic piece of bare, bare brown rooms, and on whitewashed walls, photographs of the passionate and pale Pierce. I recall wet thatch and peeling jams, and how all was best seen from below in the field. I used to sit in the rushes with, with ledger, ledger book and pencil, compiling poems of passion for Coit Calan. Often she used to linger on the sill of a window, hands by her side and brown legs akimbo, in sun-red skirt and moon-black blazer, looking toward our strange world wide-eyed. Our world was strange because it had no future. She was America-bound at summer's end. She had no choice but to leave her home, the girl with the keys to Pierce's cottage. O Coit Calan, O Coit Calan, you have gone with your keys from your own native, la own native place. Yet here in the star, El Greco eyes blaze back from your Connemara postman's daughter's proudly mortal face. So, what you really should be thinking about here is some initial impressions is what image are we given of Coit Calan to begin with? I guess when we first read what image is Koi Kalan, what kind of person does she describe as? 
how does the poet feel towards Coit and how do you think Coit feels about emigrating from Ireland. So I'm going to suggest just to take a pause now, so pause the video and read through this poem another two or three times. You really should have a good understanding of the basis of the poem before going into annotating. So just read through it again, see if you can find answers to those questions. So the image we're given of Koi Kalan is that she is somewhat mysterious, so she's repeatedly referred to as dark, so with dark hair and a bright smile. She's definitely a person of mystery, she's not the stereotypical view of an Irish girl from the countryside in the 1960s. We know that the poet has um, either a strong feelings for her, we could consider this a crush, or we could consider that he's possibly falling in love with her. We'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. Um, we can consider a number of ways that uh, Coit feels about emigrating from Ireland, and we will look back at that towards the end of the PowerPoint. Okay, there are, we want to look into the language around that before giving an answer. So the title, just to go back to that, so Pierce's Cottage. Okay, now Pierce we're talking about here is of course, of course, Porrick Pierce, the leader of the 1916 Rising. So Pierce's Cottage is a holiday home that the 19th, that Pierce, 1916 leader. Um, would have went to as a younger man. Uh, Pierce was commander in chief of the Irish forces during the Rising and he was executed after the Rising for his involvement in organisation and the running of the Rising. He was uh, based in GPO over the course of Easter week 1916. Uh, as well as being a military leader though, Pierce was an educator, he, had, he ran a school, uh, he was a writer and he was very much the philosophical head of the movement. So. Even before the Rising took place, it's very important to know, Pierce and the other leaders knew that the Rising was not going to be successful. A number of issues happened over the weekend before the Rising was uh, scheduled to take place. And it was they knew that when they uh, had this Rising, they weren't going to win. What they did in the Rising was they were offering a blood sacrifice to the Irish people to get the Irish people kind of involved in the movement supporting their fight for freedom. They sacrificed their own lives to get that coming from the people. So the cottage, and you can see a picture of it here, uh, the cottage serves as a museum now, so it celebrates both Port Pierce as the, an Irish hero, but also the cultural uh, heritage of the area. So it's very much a symbol of Irish culture and Irish history and legacy. Uh, it's a door to the history of Ireland. And Coit Canaan symbolically holds the keys to the building, meaning that, you know, symbolic position. Those, so those keys could symbolically suggest that she holds the key to Irish history, to Irish culture. Right. And you see there in the picture, the, the house is very much as described in the poem, whitewashed walls, uh, attach, detached roof, a very basic bare kind of house. So we look at the first three stanzas first. When I was 16, I met a dark girl. Her hair, dark hair was darker because her smile was so bright. She was the girl with the keys to Pierce's cottage and her name was Coit Calan. The cottage was built into the side of a hill. I recall two windows and a cosmic piece of bare brown rooms and on whitewashed walls photographs of the passionate and pale Pierce. I recall wet thatch and peeling jams and how all was best seen from below in the field. I used to sit in the rushes with ledger book and pencil compiling poems of passion for Coit Calan. So three techniques to think about here. So I want to think, can you find three different techniques in these stanzas? explain what you think each is used for. Uh, what do you think Keith Pierce's cottage might metaphorically represent? And do you notice anything interesting about the poet's choice of words in stanza three? Right, so again, you should probably pause here. You know, it's better to be thinking about some of this stuff yourself, coming up with your own answers, your own opinions, and just basing it off what I say. But do have a think about it and then continue on with the video. And so, Techniques we might be looking at here, we have the imagery around the girl, the repetition of the word dark, and this is not the kind of image you would stereotypically expect in 1960s rural Ireland for a girl to be described as, you know. So when he's talking about, I mean, a dark girl, her dark hair was darker because her smile was so bright. It's the mystery of her darkness, and yet the allure of the brightness in her smile. So that colour imagery, the darkness and the, uh, the, the contrast with the bright smile, makes her mysterious but also very alluring. Uh, we can talk about the keys to Pierce's cottage, our metaphor. 
they symbolize something greater and we can say that, that may be Irish culture, Irish history, you know, she has the keys to the hip to house of a man who was incredibly important in Irish history. She has keys to a museum, she has keys to the kind of um, more basic past of Ireland, the less materialistic view of the world represented by the uh, kind of basic elements of the house, the wet thatch and the, um, uh, the uh, small cottage. Uh, we can see there is alliteration in the last line of the second stanza. So photographs of the passionate and pale Pierce. Right? And this is just emphasising the um, more mundane aspects or how do you, plain aspects of life that uh, Pierce really enjoyed. That he wasn't someone who was overly materialistic, and that traditional Ireland isn't overly materialistic. We are, we come from, you know, Ireland's quite a poor country historically, not so much anymore, historically quite poor, and people making making use of the basics of life and getting by on the basics. Um, and another technique, then, sorry, so we have two techniques. We have the imagery, we said we have the um, alliteration. We could say that also we have um, the, uh, sorry, the imagery then in the last one, the wet thatch. Okay, symbolically, um, we can look at the wet thatch and the peeling jams as representing how this past and the symbolic history of Ireland is not being cared for. The, the house is not being well kept, taken care of, the thatch is not being replaced, the paint is peeling, and perhaps, you know, this is symbolic of Ireland not being taken care of, traditions of Ireland not being taken care of and that could be linking into the emigration that we are not taking care of the younger people and keeping our culture and our heritage alive. Um, then we can look at, so we've already talked about the Keys Pierce Cottage are symbolic of the Keys culture. Um, also in the last stanza, I'm sorry, stanza three, is so the last stanza on the board, stanza three of the poem, there's a number of strange or interesting choices in language. And this would be looking at, I used to sit in the rushes with ledger book. And ledger book is connected with business. And he says he's compiling poems of passion. So it's very strange. We don't usually consider it to people as compiling poems, more as composing poems. So here we are looking at a more business use of language rather than the um, aesthetic use of language. That this business, there's, such, there's a reason he's making this choice of compiling and making it just sound like a business transaction. He is linking this into perhaps the state of Ireland at the time. So if we go into just in a bit more detail, line by line, we start off when I was 16, I met a dark girl, the dark her dark hair was darker because of bright was so bright. So the immediate image we're given through the repetition of the word dark creates a sense of mystery around the girl, as we've said already, but her bright uh, smile represents her as being quite alluring. Uh, she was the girl with the keys to Pierce's cottage and her name was quite Kalan. So to add to the image of the girl, we were told she holds the keys to a historically important building. Um, this gives her a sense of importance and power in the world, further enhancing her desirability. So she's not just desirable because of her looks, she's desirable because she has position, she has power, she has an importance within the society she is living in. The cottage was built on the side of a hill, and I recall two windows and a cosmic piece. This cosmic piece adds a sense of spirituality and fantasy and mythology to the whole thing. And this goes back, I think it's back to kind of an Irish tradition of peace and, uh, and mythology and legend and simplicity and you know, a more basic life. So despite the simplicity of the brown rooms and the whitewashed walls, there is something magical or special about the place and by extension, the girl who controls it. So the fact that she is living within this cosmic peace brings her into this mythological world and makes her, gives her this greater stance of this uh, more alluring and intriguing character. Uh, so, and then, you know, this, you're building up this kind of fairy tale kind of world around quite. The alliteration we've already talked about, passionate yet pale, shows these two contrasting ideas about central to character of Pierce. So he was passionate, but um, embraced the less exciting aspects of life as well. Um, Though he may have enjoyed simplicity in his life, his love and his passion for country can't be underestimated, or can't be overestimated, so, um, <laughs> I should say overestimated, I don't know why I said something. You can't, you shouldn't underestimate, you can't overestimate. 
the amount of passion he had for it. Uh, if we look down at the final stanza, I recall wet thatch and peeling jams, so the cottage neglected, wet thatch and peeling jams, just could indicate that Durkin believes we are neglecting our history and our culture, but perhaps the quote is because she will soon leave Ireland, perhaps she is neglecting uh, our history, her own history and her past by doing so. Uh, and how all was best from uh, was best seen from below in the field. Uh, but being in the cottage, Durkin seemed to have lost some of the enchantment with the place. So when you're looking at it from afar, it has this more enchanting aspect. When you look at it from below, it seems more beautiful, but perhaps when he enters it, maybe it's not quite as beautiful. And then finally, as we talked about the compiling rather than posing, alongside the mentioned ledger books, brings a sense of business formality to the poem. Durkin may be commenting on the uh, changing nature of Ireland and the movement away from the mysticism of the past into a less magical, more formal way of life. He could be critiquing our lost culture, our language, or the end of emigration and out of the country. And moving on to stanzas four to six. Often she used linger on the sill of a window, hands by her side and brown legs akimbo, in red sun, in sun red skirt and moon black blazer, looking toward our strange world, wide eyed. Our world was strange because it had no future. She was America bound at summer's end. She had no choice but to leave her home, the girl with the keys to Pierce's cottage. O quite Kalan, O quite Kalan, you have gone with your keys from your own native place. Yet here in the dark, a Greco eyes blaze back from your Connemara postman daughter's proudly mortal face. So, what do we learn about Coit's future in these stanzas? Uh, why might this be important? I want you to then look up El Greco, okay, look up the paintings. You do need to see the paintings uh, to understand what he's referencing here. Do you think Durkin wants us to think about when he's using these references? And uh, what does quite seem to feel about her upcoming emigration? So again, I want to say, I should pause for a few seconds, look up and consider those questions before moving on. So uh, we learn from the stanza that Coit is leaving Ireland. She is and at summer's end, so it's quite imminent, probably quite soon. This is important because of what Coit represents with her holding the keys, and it also means there is a life and a limit put on his crush or his love for her. The El Greco painting, so if you look at the El Greco painting, it's quite dark, but with those bright eyes that he's described Coit as having. By connecting his work with the work of a Renaissance painter like El Greco, he is trying to put, say that this, what he's speaking about here is not just a limited Irish immediate problem, it's a problem or an issue that can be connected with a greater, more universal concept, right? Just like the paint, so by connecting his experience with the experience of a Renaissance painter, he's showing that there's a more universality to this idea. And quite does seem somewhat mystified by people who would maybe stay in Ireland, but just definitely, you could, would definitely think there is a sense of loss in the fact that she is leaving us. She's clearly someone who's interested in her heritage and we probably do feel sad for her because she is, as I repeated over and over again, she is the girl with the keys to Pierce's cottage. She has embraced her culture in Ireland but she is forced to leave. So if you look at the third line in stanza five, she had no choice but to leave her home. This isn't something she's like, oh I really want to go. She is most likely, she's ju maybe judging Ireland when she says that our world uh, had no future, okay, our world was strange because uh, it had no future, maybe she's judging the land as forcing her to leave, maybe she is trying to be optimistic about something else and seeing that Ireland, looking at Ireland, realising the backwardness of Ireland in that it's forcing its young people away. And just if we go into that on a bit more line by line basis, so often she used linger on a sort of window, quite uh, is Portrayed as mystical again here, uh, and her allure comes from her connection to Ireland, nature and culture. There is also an uncomfortable voyeuristic aspect in the stanza through the mention of her legs akimbo. Um, so there is some kind of sexual references going on, slight sexual references going on in here. Um, you know, he is a teenage boy looking at a girl that he is very much attracted to. There is that voyeuristic, as the word we use, aspect to his uh, fascination with her. Uh, there's also this aspect of she doesn't seem to know she's being watched. Okay, now we're not going to go too far with this. Again, this is a crush. This is a man remembering it, you know, as a teenager, the feelings he had as a teenage boy, possibly quite a shy young man. You know, don't be taking this in a, into a dark place that it doesn't belong in. He is very much 
in, you know, in the poem he's trying to show the importance of the skull and culture. Uh, the image of Koizo in sun red skirt and moon black blazer looking toward our strange world wide eyed. Um, so the image came before she must leave Ireland, it's one connected with nature with the sun red and the moon black, that is connecting her with nature. Uh, the use of the alliteration adds to the sense of harmony, so she is in harmony with the world around her and with nature. Uh, yet this type of innocence from the girl seems to imply she may be ill prepared. And maybe that's where the wide eyed is coming from. Perhaps it's fear of what's out there, fear of the unknown. You know, is she coming from a very safe and, how would you say, um, naive place having grown up in the countryside of Ireland and now going off to the big world of America. Maybe she, she isn't ready for that step. Uh, she had no choice but to leave her home then, so there's a definite hint of her, both of how, uh, of fear both for how Coit will deal with what with the wider world, but also how Ireland is going to deal with the loss of people like Coit, or losing the young people, and use, losing these symbols of Ireland and the symbol of our history and our culture, are being are going off to America. How is Ireland going to survive this this constant emigration? Uh, you know, remember this is 1960. His experience, he maybe not, although it's not written until the 1970s, his experience at 19, in the 1960s in the place where this is written from, they don't know that emigration is going to turn around later on and people are going to start coming back. It's very much decades upon decades of people leaving. Uh, the final stanza then opens with a lamenting call. Uh, you know, he is calling almost, it feels like he's almost trying to call her back. He's waiting for her, he wants her to stay, he can't lose her. Um, a call, but it's not only for the girl, it's also for the culture and, what, and the people she symbolises. So he does not want to lose either of them. And then, as we already said about the El Greco uh, paintings, this is a... Sorry, so the El Greco eyes, so she may have, she's not so easily going to be dissuaded from her culture and her heritage and her passion for these. So despite her ordinary background, so the fact that she is She's this powerful image by being connected with the El Greco eyes. It gives her power, it gives her um, the ability to hold on to her culture, perhaps. And maybe he's hoping that she will be the one who keeps her culture alive, even though the fact that she is going to be leaving for some time. Uh, there is a sense of anger that she's been betrayed by society. And there is definitely anger in here against Ireland and, what, and how Ireland is allowing its young people to leave. However, this could be read as naivety and there's a sad, uh, reality that her pride, that her passion for Ireland is going to be lost. Maybe she is just this naive girl who thinks that she will be able to keep the culture alive and keep her passions alive. And she clearly has because she holds keys to the museum. Um, but should we, do, does, this, does this bring us more empathy for her in that she is a naive, that her naivety makes her seem more innocent and we as more experienced people do we see actually no, this definitely won't happen. Um, so finally, just to think back over the poem, the themes are this idea of losing love, losing culture, and losing history. Right? And these are all things Ireland is suffering to, suffering because of emigration. So, in, on a personal level, as a young man, Durkin loses quite Galan, this girl he has fallen for. But Ireland also loses its young people and its connections with history and culture. There's definitely a nostalgia here as well. He's looking at the past and very much promoting beauty and uh, the ideas of the past as being superior. The imagery, we have the cottage, is emblematic of the proud, and, and the proud history and culture of Ireland. The keys, you have to be able to talk about the keys in this, is some symbolism to the keys of a number of things. So the keys to the past, keys to culture, perhaps the keys to the Irish language, um, but also the keys to the parish of the poet. Right? There's a personal and social interlinking here. They're all connected. Um, Coit is the image of a lost generation forced to give up families, homes, cultural identities to survive in the world. Okay? And that is what Ireland did to its young people for years and years. Uh, the language, it's informal, reflecting uh, the sense of uh, nature's informality. It is conversational, you know, Durkin is inviting us into his personal life and into his world. He's giving us this anecdote, um, but you know, it's in a very personal way. And again, this is by design. He is designing this in a conversational way to make us feel connected. Uh, the mention of El Greco, as I said, elevates this from the simple poem, speaking power to great art, uh, brings a universality to it. 
uh, as with much of his poetry, the language is straightforward, easily accessible, but contains layers of meaning beneath a seemingly simplistic style. Uh, this language could also be said to be echoed of simplicity inherent in traditional Irish life or in Coit's relaxed relationship with the world. You know, she seems very at peace with the world, her cosmic the cosmic peace that she is uh, promoted within the place, and that maybe the simplicity of the language represents her simplicity in her view of the world. And finally, it's written in six quatrains, so these are four line stanzas with no formal rhyming scheme, and this the consisting stanza lends itself to a sense of lyricism and musicality of the poem, so it is both emblematic of kind of a fairy tale aspect to it and this uh, musicality and lyricism that's there, but it's conversational and everyday at the same time. Okay, I'm just going to flip back then to the questions we asked at the very beginning, okay, the first impressions, and how do you think Coit feels about emigrating from Ireland? We didn't answer this to start, and you could say that's quite a complex feeling here. She is possibly fearful of what she's going to um, encounter, possibly enthusiastic and ambitious in going into the wider world, perhaps looking at Ireland as being backwards and this is an opportunity to succeed, uh, but perhaps we can see that while we hope for that, maybe we do view that as a naivety also. Is she ill-prepared and too innocent for the world that she is about to enter? Okay, so we're going to leave it at that for this poem, okay? Um, I hope this helps you to understand some of the aspects going on within the poem. Thank you.